Leviticus uh, offers some practical parts to the religion of the Jewish people after the building of the tabernacle. He also sets forth some other principles, such as when a house is consumed by probably mold and what is to be done about it. If a person receive, receives the disease of leprosy, and so he gives some practical this, uh, instruction, but probably the main instructions that he gives in the book of Leviticus is the offerings for sin. And so you thought there was only one offering. So if you read the first chapter of Leviticus, the first thing you come to is a burnt offering. Then you come to chapter 2, and there's a meat offering. Then you come to chapter 3, and there's a peace offering. Then you come to chapter 4, and there's a sin offering. And so uh, religion just got a little more complicated, right? Because we don't have to bring those offerings to God anymore because the sacrificial system has been completed through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. But really, what is it that these uh, principles, this, this first chapter of, of, of Luke, or Leviticus, can actually teach us? That's what we're going to look at this morning. Really, recorded in the book of Leviticus is given to us the sacrificial system. This system uh, goes back to the beginning of time. As early as the Garden of Eden, where God clothed Adam and Eve with uh, skins of animals. Remember, they sewed fig leaves together. A man always has a different way than God does. And so man's substitute for God's way is what? It's religion, right? Man trying to reach God instead of God reaching down to man and saying, this is what you need to do. So instead of following the clear instructions from God, man always seems to have a better way. And so they sewed these fig leaves together, but that was not acceptable. They hid themselves from the presence of God. They saw that they were naked, and the fig leaves seemed to work the best. It seems like that'd be a little itchy, right? I mean, how would you like to have a, a good pair of underwear with some uh, fig leaves, right? I don't know if that would work very well. But anyway, God substituted those fig leaves for what? For what? For skins. That means God had to take two animals and provide the skins to cover man's nakedness and a sacrifice that day was made. As we go on, we see also the story that uh, we see the system also in the life of Cain and Abel when we come to Genesis chapter 4, and we see Abel's offering. And Abel, he also brought of the firstling of his flock and of the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. In Hebrews chapter 11, we have the faith chapter, and there his name is recorded as well. Hebrews says of Abel's offering, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it being dead, yet speaketh. After Noah got out of the ark, he made a sacrifice unto the Lord. And there it says it was a sweet savor in the nostrils of God. And from that time, God gave a covenant, a promise that he would no longer destroy the earth with a flood. And there we have the giving of the rainbow. Of course, he didn't say he wasn't going to destroy the earth. He's going to destroy it. 2 Peter chapter 3 talks about the fact that this present earth will someday be destroyed by fire. Last week we called that global warming. There is such a thing as global warming. It's in the Bible. If that isn't global, global warming, nothing else could be. It says with fervent heat, this earth is going to melt. It's going to pass away. And that is waiting still in the future. The sacrificial system of the Bible is as old as the beginning of time. This system was not invented, an invention of man, but prescribed by God himself. And so now even before the law, the giving of this law in Leviticus, God 
and you see in the Bible that people made sacrifices unto God. You see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You see Job, the first book in the Bible, probably around 2000 BC or before, actually making a sacrifice for his kids. Part of their religion was a sacrifice, the covering of their sins. See, every time a sacrifice was made, it was a covering for their sin. It was a picture of what would take place in the future. And really, as you look through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, what do you see? You see a river of blood. That blood never stopped because the sacrificial system never stopped because man sinned. And when they sinned, guess what? There had to be uh, a way to cover that sin. Yearly, the priest would go into the most holy place for the sacrifice for the people. It was the Day of Atonement. We see that as they came out of Egypt, God says that they were to take a lamb and they were to take the blood and to put it on the doorpost of the house. He says, when I see that blood, I will pass over you. Every time the blood was applied to an Israeli house, the death angel passed over that house that night. Remember, the firstborn of every animal and the firstborn of every human lost their life that night. It says there was a great weeping and crying in the land of Egypt, such as there never was before. Could you imagine all of a sudden the firstborn of every house of the Egyptian? Egyptian people find, find the parents find that, that child dead. And so that system has been there from the beginning. Where did they get it from? It started off in the garden. And yet, as you come to the New Testament, it talks about the Passover. He says, you know what? Christ is our Passover. Hey, that's an amazing verse. What is the Passover? What is the significance of the Passover? God is going to pass over us. The penalty of sin is death. If Christ is our Passover, he will pass over us when it comes to judgment. The blood's applied. Just like it was applied on the doorpost of the Israeli house, so the blood of Christ has been applied to our life. Christ, Paul says, is our Passover. That's an amazing thing, that God provided the sacrifice, and that sacrifice extended to you and me, and today Christ is our Passover. And so we see that system throughout the Old Testament. These offerings of animals pictured a future time when God would provide the ultimate sacrifice of his only son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And John said when he saw Jesus, behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. John 1, 29. Then you come down to John 1, 36, and this is what John writes. And again, the next day after John stood and, and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold, behold the Lamb of God. Paul records in 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And all of a sudden we think, well, Christ became sin. He took on uh, he took on lying and stealing and all those other bad sins. For he says here, for he hath made him to be sin for us. And what the idea here is that he has made him, just like the Old Testament, he has made him to be a sin offering. It's not sin. Christ never became sin. He became a sin offering. And he hath made him to be a sin offering for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The writer of Hebrews writes these words in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12. He says, Neither by the blood of goats or calves, but by his own blood, he entered into the holy place once, just once, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Leviticus also says, tells us that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Paul writes in Colossians and Ephesians almost identical verses, and here they are. 
Colossians chapter 1, verse 14 says, In whom we have redemption. We have redemption. How do we have redemption? Because we're good people? Because we come to church on Sunday? Because we try to do right? We try to live a good life? No, he says that's not the occasion. That's not why we have redemption. We have redemption through his blood. And what does redemption in his blood provide? It says, even the forgiveness of sins. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. Colossians 1.14. Then you come to Colossians 1.7, and Paul records almost similar verses, and yet he adds on another phrase. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Hey, you know what God did for you 2,000 years ago? He provided a way for you to be forgiven. Every sin that you have ever committed has been washed away in salvation. Past, present, future. So that when we stand before God, we are not judged for our sins. He will not say on such and such a day you did this and this and this. Those sins are no longer a part of our life. They have been washed away. They have been taken care of. Our sins have been judged. Not by us. Our sins have been judged on the cross some 2,000 years ago. And so God no longer sees us as sinners. He sees us as saints. He sees us as accepted in the beloved. We are accepted in Christ. We are accepted in him. He imputes, he gives us his righteousness. We stand perfect, clothed in righteousness before the very throne of God. And so we stand anew in forgiveness because of what Christ did for us on the cross. And really, we could go on. You say, please don't do that. <laughs> well, we could go on for hours. And we could go on for days showing God's plan of redemption as he provides redemption for man through death and the sacrifice or the shedding of blood. It is based upon death. It is based upon the shedding of blood. And really, what is it that the Bible teaches? I mean, communicating the gospel to someone else. What are you communicating? You are communicating the fact that God teaches in the Bible a substitutionary death. A substitute. A substitute, just like in these offerings, whether it's the burnt offering, meat offering, peace offering, sin offering, there is a substitute. Who's the substitute? It's the innocent lamb. And I had to identify, if I brought a lamb Okay, he gives all, all, all the categories here. You know, the rich people probably had a little more uh, pasture and they had a little more cattle, so maybe they could afford to bring a bull ox. Those that were less fortunate, they could bring a goat or a lamb. If you were less fortunate, he says, you could bring even a pigeon. Okay, it didn't matter. The thing mattered is you had to bring an offering. It had to be the death, a substitutionary death. Each one of these things lost their life, whether it was from the animal kingdom, whether it was the bullocks, whether it was the sheep, the goat, the, the dove, or the dove, or the, the pigeon, they lost their life. They were, your, they were your substitute. And so now, what does the Bible teach? It teaches the substitutionary death of one who was innocent and died in our place. Actually, a picture of what Christ did for us on the cross 2,000 years ago. The innocent, the one who knew no sin, it says, became sin or sin offering for us. And so really, what is it that the Bible teaches? It teaches the substitutionary death or atonement of Christ dying in our place so that we might have and receive his forgiveness. Paul says that we are justified, or we are declared righteous. How are we declared righteous before God? Well, he says we are justified by his blood. Well, you've got to have the blood of Christ to be justified. He says we are justified by faith. 
Oh, we are justified by faith. That's the only way any person will ever get saved. Old or New Testament, Abraham believed God and it was imputed, it was counted unto him for righteousness. How did Abraham begin this relationship with God? It was through faith. We are justified or declared righteous through faith. So there's justification by his blood. There's justification by faith. There is justification by grace. We receive something we do not deserve, God's unmerited favor. We deserve eternal judgment, separation, punishment from God, but he gives us his unmerited favor, his grace. And so we stand justified before a holy God. I mean, the Bible says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Who is God? Who is God? There's a new calculation now that there are planets as far as, get this, you know what a light year is? It's a long distance, right? There are planets as far as 12 or 14 billion light years away. Billion. Billion light years. 12 to 14 billion light years. Who is God? Well, he's the creator of the universe. I mean, you have all the other things that you find in the Bible. He's the great I am. He's all present. He's all powerful. He's all knowing. All his other attributes. Who is God? Hey, you better not mess with him. You better go his way because his way is the only way. There is no other way because he has laid down the plan for our redemption. Your plan isn't going to work. I say every man formulates their own religion. And the more you talk to people, the more, the more you realize they have their own religion. Well, I believe, I believe God is too good to throw anyone in hell. Well, that's, that's what you believe. That's your own religion. Well, I believe, and I'll tell you whatever they believe, which came off the top of their head, but it's inconsistent with what God says in the scripture, and your way isn't going to work. Your way isn't going to work. There is only one way. Christianity is exclusive. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There is no other option. And yet God has provided in his great love, his great mercy for our redemption. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting love. God commended, God showed his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So what is it that we can learn from this first chapter of Leviticus, as there he describes the burnt offering? How does that play out in our everyday life? We have been freed from that system through the death of Christ, but there are still some lessons that we can learn and are practical for us today. I mean, we can come to the Bible and all of a sudden you read it and say, all right, let's hurry up and get through this passage of Scripture, right? The, the book of Leviticus is something that uh, we want to pass over very quick. Like, hey, there's too much going on here, too much to understand, and so on. But really, it is the book that Peter quotes, and he says, uh, Be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Well, he sets forth in the Leviticus principles whereby we are to live and to the way we are to live. So Peter picks up on what Leviticus says, what Moses says in this book, and one of the quotations he says is, Be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. So it certainly has some things to teach us in our everyday life. So we have the directions concerning the offering uh, in the chapter before us are introduced in such a way as to indicate that the lawgiver was not propounding a new form of worship, but <coughs> relating the ritual of one already understood and in use. So really, as you come to this chapter, this chapter is penned probably around 1450 B.C., and yet this system was already in effect. 
Even other nations use the sacrificial system, indicating that they derive their origin from the same source, which is a divine, a divine institution ordained to the parents of our race. God instructed Adam and Eve, and you see that because their, their son, Abel, offered the same sacrifice, and a, a, a sacrifice of a lamb uh, to God himself. Up to, the, up to this time of the flood and thereafter. So from the time of Genesis to the time of the flood, we see the sacrificial system being put into place. Through Noah and his family, it was transmitted to all, all future generations of men, wherever, uh, wherever dispersed over the earth. So we see there's a system here that God sets forth. Okay, does that system end? Yes, the system has pretty much ended by the sacrifice of Christ. Even there will be, okay, we have four temples that are recorded in the Bible. The first temple was built by Solomon, it was destroyed by the Babylonians, it was rebuilt 70 years later, or so on, it took them a little time to, to get it together and build it again because they were dragging their feet. But then you have the second temple that was built. The third temple will be built during the time of the tribulation. How do we know that? Because it says the Antichrist will go in and there offer the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet. So what is the what is the place and where where is where is the place that the Antichrist will rule this world? Well, Rome would be a good place, right? It's not Rome, though. It is Jerusalem. He is going to be ruling and reigning over this world from Jerusalem. Then we see that God comes and the millennial half, the millennial takes place, the thousand year reign of Christ. During that reign of Christ, there is going to be a rebuilding of the temple in Ezekiel chapter 40 through 48. And so now, what is the, what is the need for a temple or any sacrifice since it has already been completed by the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And just as we gather once a month to partake of the Lord's Supper as a remembrance of what Christ did for us, there will be a remembrance for a thousand years throughout that millennial kingdom. A sacrifice will be made as a reminder of what Christ did for us. And so we have this perpetual offering going on the principle from this passage, is, well, the principle that we're going to look at, the principles are a number, a couple here, but the first principle that in this passage is this, that God has not left us to our own imagination, but has communicated divine revelation to us. See, God hasn't left us to come up with our own plans and solutions for man's sin, but he has given us divine revelation. God has not left us to our own imaginations, but has communicated divine revelation to us. We find that in verse 1 and 2. And the Lord called unto Moses and spoke unto him out of the tabernacle of the congregation, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, If any man of you bring an offering unto the Lord, he shall bring an offering of the cattle, even of a herd and of a flock. And right away, we have some instructions that are given to Moses to give to the people, which we actually have recorded as scripture. So we have a communication, divine revelation from God. He says, speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them. Here, here we have the very voice of God communicating revelation through Moses to the people. The children of Israel, uh, uh, to the people of God and to the children of Israel, we have God's communication given to us, revealed through his written scriptures. So what do we have in the Bible? We have God's communication given, revealed in a written form, the scriptures to us as individuals. Well, what do we have in the scripture? We have 66 off, we have 66 books, some 40 different authors, written over a time period of some 1,400 years. Differing education levels. 
different backgrounds. We have kings, David, Solomon, writing parts of this scripture. We have a farmer, Amos. We have some fishermen that pen some of these books of the Bible. All different kinds of backgrounds. Some were prophets, whatever, but they all recorded scripture. They recorded a message from God, which was recorded and is given to the world. Yet there is perfect unity. Can you imagine different places where these people wrote? They didn't all get into one a monastery and start writing the Bible. They wrote from different locations over a 1400 year period, 40 different authors, and yet, you know what you have in the Bible? Perfect unity. There are no contradictions. One, you find one precept here, you find it reiterated here, you might have a greater light to that in another portion of scripture. You have perfect unity. You have prophecy that is given that God wrote hundreds of years before all the prophecies relating to the person of Christ. His, his birth, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his triumphant coming, his second coming, his kingdom that will happen in the future, the regathering of Israel, all given with precise uh, words. Only God could know the future. Only God could tell us what is going to happen tomorrow. You turn to the New Testament, the book of Revelation, he already tells you what is going to happen in the future. And how is it going to happen in the future? Exactly how God said it was going to happen. There's going to be no deviation from what God has recorded in the scripture. There's perfect uh, unity. We have God's recorded thoughts, some as recorded history as we look back at the Bible and even a prophetic uh, foretelling of the future. We have God's revelation. We have God's voice. We have everything God wants us to know. And yet, here comes the punchline, you ready? I put my gloves on now. Because <laughs> I'm going to go for a knockout, right? <laughs> Here's the punchline. Are you ready? How long have you been a believer? Ten years? Five years? Fifteen years? Twenty years? Thirty years? Forty years? Fifty years? How many years have you been a follower and a believer in Christ? Here's the knockout. How many times have you read the Bible? Is it something you just pick up occasionally when you're in distress? Oh, I gotta read through the book of Psalms, I need some relief here. Or I need to pick it up and dust it off or run around the house to find it. Like the Pastor Rustler's friend went to their church and was a guest speaker there. He said, how many people brought their Bible with them today? And uh, some raised their hands. If you have your Bible, raise up your Bible. How many people uh, brought their Bibles tonight? So they did. And he said, and the rest of you, where did you think you were going tonight? <laughs> but anyway, it's not that we, we, we have to bring it to church. It's more important that you, you have to read it every day, okay? That's an important part. Wait, if this is the Word of God, if it is inspired by God, if it is the voice of God, why are you reading it? Why are you giving time to this book every day? There's something wrong with your Christianity if you're not reading this book every day. Okay? I've been saved 42 years, okay? I just read through the Bible once again in the last three months. You can do it. That's my 65th time of reading the Bible. Why do I read the Bible? It's important to me. I cannot go without reading this word every day. You're going into a world. You're fighting spiritual battles. You've got things going on in your life and you're going into the world with your armor off without God's help and his power that is supporting you through his work. How are you doing it? I'd like to know because I'm hardly making it. Maybe you've got some secret that I don't have. Maybe you've got some spiritual insight and powers that I don't have. You can't do it. Believe me, you can't do it without hearing the voice of God. This is the voice of God. I listened to this fellow on, on YouTube, and he's got a series on Isaiah, and I'm listening to the series on Revelation. 
And he says, you can read through the Bible in 72 hours at a sixth grade level. 72 hours. That will all, all take you from Genesis all the way to Revelation. He said he was asked to speak to some missionaries that were going, 300 missionaries that were going out into all parts of the world and addressing these future missionaries. He addressed them and asked them a question. The question that he asked them was this. How many of you, and, and these are, if they're missionaries, they've probably gone through Bible school, maybe some even in seminary. So they spent at least four to eight years in education. The question that he asked was, how many of you have read through the Bible from cover to cover? These are people that are going out into the darkest jungles of who knows where, and yet they've never read the Bible from cover to cover. He says the majority of those that were going to be missionaries had never read the Bible from cover to cover. What part does God play in our everyday life? What part does he have? Do we read his scriptures? Does God communicate to us? Uh, so how, how, uh, how many times have you read through this book? I mean, how long have you been saved? How many times have you read through God's book? Well, there's the time factor. I'm too busy. I have a busy life. You don't know. I got to get up early. I have a busy life. Well, I was there too. I used to start work at 7 o'clock in the morning. I got up at 5 o'clock every morning to read the scripture and pray before I went to work. I could have got up at 6. Okay, work was 15, 20 minutes away. So I could have, I could have rushed over there and maybe even got out of, rolled out of bed at 6.30 and, you know, slicked down the hair. I used to have hair back then. Probably would have taken me a little longer. Now you just let it blow in the wind and it falls into place, but whatever. But you know what? You take time because that is what is important to you. For 42 years, there's been a handful of times, a handful, maybe 30 times that I have not read the Bible in 42 years. Wait, is this important? Is it just something we get up and spout off on Sunday morning and here he goes again, hope it's not too long? Is that, is that all the Bible means to us? Something we gather and hopefully get enough to make it through the week? No. Okay, well, I'm busy. I don't have time. Well, all right. Let's, uh, let's take a little evaluation of your time. How much time do you spend every day on social media? Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, texting, whatever. Other social media. How much time do you spend every day watching TV, reading the newspaper, or, or looking at YouTubes? How about getting out of Facebook and putting your face in the Word of God. I mean, you'll be, believe me, you will be a much happier person and less stressful when you leave those things behind because now we find ourselves minding every day everyone else's business and we're not even listening to God. We don't have time, really. How much time do you spend every day in social media? How much time do you have? Oh yeah, I mean, some people, I know, I know some people, they are the first ones to post on someone's post social media. If you look, they're on everybody's social media. Wait, they got time for that. People sit for hours in front of their cell phones and, and, go and flip through this, that, and the other. They know everybody's business, you know? And, and you're, you're not being deceived. You think there, there's a happy life out there somewhere? Oh, look at us. We're sitting on, on some beach in Florida. Oh, what they're not showing you is the way to Florida. All the fighting and arguments they had in the car before they got to Florida. But now let's everybody smile. We're on Facebook. It's all an illusion, okay? You know, spend some less time on social media and spend some time in God's Word. You do have time. It's just a matter of what you are using your time for. You have 24 hours a day. What are you using your time for? They, people know other people's business more than they know God's business. Well, it's time that we spend some time uh, learning about God's business, business and God's word. And he's recorded it there. God in his wisdom has seen fit, for the most part, to address his creatures through the intervention of mediators and through the moral law, which was spoken in thunder and in lightning from Sinai. And the ceremonial law 
pointing to the great gospel sacrifice was given in a milder voice from the mercy seat. And the Lord called unto Moses and spoke unto him. Moses stood without, and there he heard the audible voice from God from the mercy seat addressing him. It said that the Lord called him, indicating that God now spoke, not with a loud thundering voice as he did from Mount Sinai, but with a lower and gentler tone. Remember the people when they heard the voice of God, they said, hey, Moses, uh, you, you talk to God. We don't want to hear from God anymore. This is, this is way too scary. As befitting a milder and more permanent mode of communication. See, we have God's mode of communication, and it's called the Scripture. By the phrase, out of the temple is meant out of the most holy place from the mercy seat between the cherub where God did reside. It was there that he heard the voice of Jehovah. The question is, are you hearing the voice of God daily? I mean, we don't, we don't really realize what we have in the Scripture. You know what we have in the Scripture? We have the voice of God. It's not a loud, thundering voice like Mount Sinai when he gave the law. But if you, in quietness, Open your, open your Bible, ask the Holy Spirit to teach you. You know what you will hear? You will hear the voice of God. Hey, you're going through trouble. Is your life being turned upside down? You need comfort, you need direction, you need help, you need encouragement. What is it that you need? Where are you going for your needs? Hey, God has it all. He wants to meet your needs, just like we looked at Psalm 23. The God is there. When we know him, he's our shepherd. He says, I shall not want. He will provide my every need. And yet we do not take the opportunities to find God in our everyday life. Are we hearing the voice of God daily? Or are we living a meaningless, empty life, running to and fro throughout the earth? Without hearing from God, listening to his voice, listening for his directions. It was said of C.T. Studd, who sold everything he had, very rich, wealthy man. His father was very rich, and he would have inherited it all. He left, and he became a missionary in China, Africa, and I believe India as well, if I remember his biography. He got up every morning at 4 a.m. From 4 a.m. to 6 a.m., he would read the scripture daily. Every day he heard from God, and what he heard from God, he communicated to men. It was said of George Mueller, the man of faith, this one who took care of some 2,000 orphans each and every day, this great man of faith that he had read through the Bible some 200 times in his life. The guy that I listened to on YouTube, uh, John Barnett, that's great. I mean, if you want a Bible education, just put on John Barnett in Isaiah uh, Lesson 1. There's 15 lessons in Isaiah, 20 lessons in, in uh, Revelation. There's a lot of stuff. This guy is teaching people around the world uh, through, because he can't travel anymore, but people are watching. He's got 300 students right now somewhere in the world, okay? And so this guy, I listened to, this guy says you can read the Bible through in 72 hours. He has read through the Bible in his life so far 115 times, okay? He said while he was going to college, I don't know, for one year, he read the Bible 12 times in a year, once a month. Wait, the question is, and you can see, why is God using this guy? Why is God using this guy? You listen to him, I you get a good, it's like going to seminary, you're going to get a good Bible education. Why is it that God is using individuals? Because they take time to hear from God. What they hear from God, they communicate to others. That's our responsibility, right? What I hear from God, I communicate to you. And that's passing it on. But see, that's not enough. You cannot survive off of what you get on a Sunday or Sunday morning service. You need to be in God's Word itself. If this book is not a part of your daily life, you are running on empty. You're empty. 
An empty, defeated life. How do I know that you have an empty and defeated life? Because you do. I know you do. Why are you defeated? Because the Bible says that God's word is the sword of the Spirit. He says, take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. You think you can fight the devil, and you can fight your flesh, and you can deal with all the issues of life apart from God's word? I'll tell you right now, I don't know what you do every day, but one thing I know for sure, you're living a meaningless, defeated life. You cannot live the Christian life apart from God's word. Jesus says, my word is truth. He said, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You can't live the Christian life. I mean, it's like going into battle and leaving your gun home. Well, what are you on the battlefield for? <laughs> I mean, stand behind, uh, let's see, who's, who's a good shot here? <laughs> Paul, okay, I'm going to battle, but I'm going to stand behind Paul. And I hope he doesn't get shot because he's my protection. Well, you go to, you go to the battle, you go to battle, it's like, where's your gun? You go to battle, a spiritual battle, where's your sword? He says the sword of the Spirit is the word of God. He said, put on the whole armor of God, and the last thing you're supposed to do is take the sword, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. When Jesus was tempted, what did he do? Hey, get away from me, you know? Leave me alone. No, he says, it is written. Three times he quotes from the Old Testament. It is written. It is written. It is written. How is it that he defeated Satan in his life? It is written. And if you can't go to the Bible and stand upon it because it's not a part of your life, I know for one thing for sure, you are living a defeated Christian life. You are living a miserable life because you are not hearing the voice of God. Believe me, that's the very first thing I do every morning. You know what I do? Coffee. <laughs> and after I get my coffee, I go to my room, and there I open the Bible. There's not a day I don't do the same routine. Sometimes for hours, sitting there reading God's Word. Why? Because it's important to me. And it should, as a believer, it should be important to you as well. Just in closing, because I only did half the sermon, but in closing, Isaiah writes these words, and thou and thy and thine ear, thine ear shall hear a word behind thee. Thine ear shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is the way. Walk ye in it when ye turn to the right hand and to the left hand. And thine ear shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is the way. Walk ye in it. Just a couple of verses in nice, or some Proverbs, and we'll close. It talks about wisdom. Wisdom crieth without, she uttered their voice in the street. She cried in the chief places of concourse. She opens her, she's op, she opens uh, in the opening of the gates. In the, in the city, she uttered her words, saying, How long do you simple ones will you love simplicity? How long uh, will you scorners delight in scorning? And fools hate knowledge. Turn you at my reproof. I will pour my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. Because I have called and you refused, I stretched out my hand to no man regarded. But ye have said it not all my counsel and would none of my reproof. I will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation, your destruction cometh as a whirlwind. When distress and anguish, you know what distress and anguish is? When distress and anguish cometh upon thee, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but not find me. For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel, they despised my reproof. Therefore shall they eat the fruit of their own way, and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them, the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But whoso, here's, here's where we need to live, but whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil. That's what God's word will do for you. For whosoever hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil. 
know what? Anguish, distress, destruction are going to come your way. They're going to come your way. But you better make sure when it comes your way that you're ready for it. And you're never really ready. But one thing for sure is when you got God and He's speaking to you, guess what? He's going to see you through. You need to hear the voice of God each and every day. That's it. That's the Christian life. That, that's Christianity 101. That's kindergarten Christianity. Christianity 101 is read the Bible, pray, and tell others about your faith. Hey, that's 101. And you'll never leave 101, okay? You never graduate from kindergarten, okay? You're always going to be playing over there in the sandbox, okay? But you know what? It's the basics. As soon as you leave those basics off, life isn't the same. Let's pray. Father, uh, once again, we thank you for your word that you left us your word to give us great strength, encouragement, light along the way. All the other things that your word says it does, that it is bread to us, we shall not live by bread alone, it is meat, it is everything that we need for life. Lord, help us to be partakers of your divine, everlasting word each and every day. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand as we sing that thing we